One of the most important treatments for sickle cell disease is hydroxyurea. And um, this is um, a relatively inexpensive drug that's been shown in well-controlled prospective studies to reduce the frequency of crisis by 50%, to reduce the duration of hospitalization by 50%, and in fact, to de decrease the mortality in about 40% uh, in adults when they use this medication. Um, the biggest problem, in my opinion, especially in the adult world, is that there's misunderstandings about the drug and it's not used. Uh, so, um, but nonetheless, it's very effective. Hydroxyurea also decreases the uh, transcranial Doppler velocities that in the screening test that I mentioned earlier, and it decreases the incidence of stroke. And so there's been great interest in seeing whether this drug would be effective in preventing strokes in children or whether it could be used uh, to treat patients who, had ha who have had strokes so that they might re not require um, transfusion. Uh, there have been a couple of superb studies that were done uh, uh, by Dr. Russell Ware, um, two major trials one called the SWITCH trial and one called the TWITCH trial. The latter, the results from the latter study have recently come out and it does look like hydroxyurea can be prov uh, effective for primary prevention, these patients that have a high blood flow from preventing them from having strokes and this could prevent the, the need for these chronic transfusions. One of the big problems with the use of transfusion to prevent the occurrence of stroke is that the follow-up study from that really didn't, it, it implied that you need to continue those transfusions for life. And so this means that about 25% of children with sickle cell disease wind up being on transfusions for life or for a very long time and the iron overload becomes an issue. Dr. Ware tried to um, determine if hydroxyurea could be used to replace transfusion for protection of patients who had already had a stroke. And this is the trial that's called the SWITCH trial. Um, this uh, trial turned out not giving the results that were wanted, uh, largely because of a uh, design flaw in the, in the study itself. Um, in this study, the, the hypothesis was that iron overload was um, uh, a major toxicity in this disease and that um, the advantage of, of uh, doing phlebotomy, which means drawing blood from the patient to remove iron, um, or the advantage of that in controlling iron would, would outweigh the slight disadvantage of hydroxyurea over transfusion for prevention of stroke. And so they used what's called a composite primary endpoint for that statistical design, and I don't want to go into that in great detail, but fundamentally um, uh, for that study, the the success of the study was dependent upon two things simultaneously, reduction in stroke rate and also um, superiority of control of iron. And the study failed on the iron overload part of the study and was stopped uh, before any conclusive decision could be made regarding the efficacy for stopping stroke. Although it did, it does look like there is some ability, that hydroxyurea does help, but there's no statistical uh, support for that, unfortunately. Major strokes in sickle cell disease are similar to what we think of in elderly people who have strokes. They have major uh, motor impairment and, and damage, brain damage, basically, from the stroke. Patients with uh, sickle cell disease also can have something that's referred to as um, uh, as silent strokes or silent cerebral infarcts. These are very small areas, usually a couple of millimeters that are, or so in diameter that, are, uh, that occur in the brain. And there are no overt symptoms that the patient has. But they occur in parts of the brain that affect cognitive function.
And so if you do uh, cognitive testing on, on children who have these, you'll see that it can be significantly impaired. And about 40% or so of kids have these by the time that uh, they're 8 to 12 years of age. So this occurs in, in, in quite high frequency. On physical examination, there's nothing that you find. There are no neurologic findings whatsoever. Um, these can be associated also with a higher frequency or highly, higher likelihood of having other kinds of uh, blood vessel disease uh, in the brain. And in fact, a, a very high percentage of sickle cell patients, you know, up to 75 or 80 percent by the time they're 20 years old, have some evidence of brain blood vessel disease of some kind. It turns out that transfusion will also significantly decrease, it basically cuts in half the frequency of these silent strokes. And this was recently uh, published by Dr. Michael Debon uh, in a, a very large, uh, well, extremely well done prospective randomized trial uh, where patients with silent stroke were randomized to either receive transfusion every three weeks with the intent of keeping the hemoglobin S down or not. How to use this data is not entirely clear to me. Uh, the article that uh, Debon wrote doesn't recommend um, transfusing all these patients. And if this was the case, we would be transfusing essentially half of the patients with sickle cell disease. These strokes in this study, um, the progression of the strokes was in a relatively small percentage of the patients. You know, 7% or so of the patients, and this frequency of progression was cut in half, but it's st still not um, of the same magnitude it was, it, that was seen in the studies by Adams, where the TCD predicted a 30% chance of a life-threatening stroke. So while it's clear that transfusion reduces the uh, incidence of silent stroke, um, I don't think that we really have a clear idea of what to do. And I think most of us would really be resistant to transfusing all of these patients because there would be a huge uh, burden. The uh, uh, number of patients that would have significant help from, uh, while it would be statistically significantly reduced, is really not clear in balance uh, what, the, uh, what the best thing to do is in, in, in that circumstance. Uh, nonetheless, the problem of cognitive function, whether it's from silent stroke or from major stroke in these patients, really is a significant medical problem. Because this means that when they're adults, um, um, they, they can't function normally. They, um, uh, in addition, I mean, adults have a high frequency of chronic pain, which is, uh, affects their quality of life. When you look at their neurocognitive functioning, sometimes their verbal skills will be acceptable so that when you speak with these patients, you may not notice that there's anything wrong, but their executive functions and their math functions and those kinds of parameters can be quite significantly affected. So they can't make change, they can't hold down jobs, they can't remember to go to their doctor's appointments. Uh, so all of these factors, which also aren't understood by the general uh, population of medical providers, these things all have an effect of the, of the ability of these patients to interact with the complex healthcare system, to interact with the complex uh, insurance and payer situation, to fill out all these forms, to remember to go to the doctor. Uh, and then, of course, that's augmented by the fact that there are very few physicians that have uh, significant expertise in dealing with these things. So the stroke issue is a major uh, major issue with this disorder that it affects the patients in many ways.